Good afternoon. Uh, it is great to see all of you here. I'm just going to talk for uh, a little bit about what we're doing in very practical terms in New York City. Um, and I couldn't have asked for sort of a better lead up than the presenters before here before me, uh, you'll see a lot of parallels in the themes of what we're trying to do and what the other presenters talked about. So this is, you know, we call this building a smart and equitable city. And I'd encourage you all when you're at the Smart City Expo to come by our pavilion. Uh, you'll see a lot more about this effort and you'll see a lot of the companies that are implementing this work. So I love this quote because I think this is very relevant in cities of all kinds right now. It's a quote from William Gibson, and it's, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. Uh, and we see this very much in New York. Here's a couple, uh, couple stories from last summer, and these two stories came out within months of each other. So the first one here is million, millionaires are taking over New York City, right? That we have more than 389,000 millionaires in New York. It's, it's ridiculous. It's obscene. Uh, it's more millionaires than anywhere else in the world. However, a couple months later, you have this story that came out. Half of New York City is living near poverty, right? That 46% uh, of households are barely making ends meet. And this is in the same city. This is in a city that, uh, generally speaking, people look at as a model uh, for other cities to strive at to. And here we have this incredible dichotomy that we have millions of New Yorkers who just can't pay their bills and keep their heat on, and then we have individuals who are making just really just obscene amounts of money. And in many cases, they're just a subway stop or two away from each other. And when we look at technology, uh, technology really has the it can serve two different roles, right? Technology can be driving this inequality, right? You can imagine two different individuals uh, or two households, one that has internet access and the other that doesn't. And you imagine uh, how hard it is for someone to, you know, for a kid to do their homework or for their parent to uh, find a job, the grandparents to stay in touch with other family members versus a family who has all of those resources available to them. And from the very beginning, the, those, that one child has an incredible leg up on the other. And so in New York, we're really focused on figuring out how do we actually make sure that technology is a means to, uh, to narrow that inequality and to really drive change. And so. One of the first pieces here is connectivity. Uh, here's the stat here, 22% of New Yorkers don't have internet access at home. About 600,000 people, again, this is in one of the wealthiest cities in the world. And if you look at uh, this stat, when you look at houses that, at below the poverty level, it jumps to 38%. And it's not that we don't have internet access, uh, we have 100% sort of wired city, but what happens here is that individuals just can't afford to get connected. And so our first step here, um, we believe, is that we have to blanket the city uh, not only with free Wi-Fi, but we also have to make sure that we are make, that homes and businesses have low-cost internet. And so here's one piece of that. Uh, you're going to see in the years ahead up to 10,000 of these structures here rolling out across New York, and they're called links. You can see one of these at our pavilion uh, at the Smart City Expo tomorrow. So what we did here is we really just took a piece of street furniture that lots of cities around the world have and we reinvented it. Uh, pay phones have been around for decades. They've generally become increasingly less and less used. The technology is antiquated. They're viewed as an eyesore. We get tons of complaints from small businesses and residents who just want them off of the sidewalks. But instead of just ripping out these structures, what we tried to do instead is to reinvent them. We put out a broad call to the private sector to say, what could we do with these? And we said, how could we leverage the advertising that is currently on payphones? And what came about is this structure here. And we're providing gigabit speed internet uh, across New York. You can see that that's a lot more than that. One, because we want to recognize that not all New Yorkers have laptops, not all New Yorkers have phones. And so there's a tablet there that anybody can walk up uh, and use to connect to the internet. You're able to make phone calls uh, anywhere in the United States for free. We have the digital displays on the side which provide 
uh, advertising, but also public service announcements. So you can imagine in the case of a natural disaster and needing to send messages out to specific locations, we can do that uh, instantaneously through these network devices. Uh, and obviously a lot of the uh, key things there like cell phone chargers, 911 calls in there. But from our standpoint, this is really about, as I was saying, connecting the city as the first step. And we're doing that in other ways. We're investing money into our public housing to provide free internet for low-income New Yorkers. We're wiring our commercial corridors. And we're doing this in as many creative ways as possible. We're really calling on the private sector to say, how can you use the assets that we have, uh, and in many cases, monetize that. So the Link NYC uh, structures that I mentioned those actually don't cost a penny to taxpayers in the city. They're actually going to be generating millions of dollars through that advertising on the side. So it's key, though, that internet connecting the city is just the first step. And then what happens? What do you do once you establish that connectivity? Uh, it's more than just enabling people to watch videos. From our standpoint, we look at how can we impact the largest number of New Yorkers. Uh, and you'll see I'm going to walk through three case studies here very quickly. And the focus here is not only improving how government works, but it's improving the lives of individuals. Okay, so first one here, uh, these are waterless water meters. And so we started an effort a number of years ago to put small little boxes, you see these little boxes here that say DEP, there's about 817,000 of those now that are on the outside of buildings in New York. And at the end of the day, it's pretty simple. They connect down to the water meter in the basement of buildings, uh, and they're sending up regularly about every hour uh, the amount of water that's being used in buildings. Sounds pretty simple at the end of the day. Uh, this has saved the city about a $3 million a year. Uh, previously, we had to send people out into basements, and they try, somebody had to be home in order to actually read the meter to see uh, how much water had been used. But it's not only about saving the city dollars. It's led to a 56% reduction in billing disputes because individuals aren't getting estimated bills anymore. They actually are getting accurate, real information. And we're enabling residents to get email alerts whenever there's an unusual spike in water usage. So that saved residents so far about $73 million just by detecting those leaks early when otherwise you might not know for them about those leaks for months. So real simple sort of application here, leveraging connectivity to improve not only the efficiency of government, but also the residents. In the public safety space, and this is a company that you guys can talk to at our pavilion if you're interested, uh, there's a company called ShotSpotter, and essentially what they're doing is they're putting acoustic sensors on the top of buildings. We started this in the South Bronx and in Brooklyn, we're now expanding this, and Essentially what these sensors do, if you look at this image here, they use a technique called triangulation. So they detect a gunshot when it goes off, and they're able to, using three different sound uh, sensors, detect within 25 meters the location of that gunshot. And you might say, well, why is that important? Well, it's really important because a lot of people actually don't call 911 or uh, call the police when they hear a gunshot. We estimate uh, about nationwide only about one in five gunshots are reported. And what we're able to do here is detect the specific frequency of those gunshots. And within one minute, an individual is verifying that that is in fact a gunshot. And they're able to take that location and then connect it to other data feeds. So if we have video camera feeds in the area, if we have other uh, images and things in the area, we can instantly pull that together and we can send that out to our police in the field. So this is, again, it's not only about sort of saving money for the police department who all the, you know, who is perhaps sending out the police force for uh, false alarms and things like that, but we're also able to save lives because we're able to react quicker. Uh, and as many of you know, in lower income communities, uh, it's the rates of reporting, the rates of civic engagement tend to be less. And so the goal here is to, again, to ensure equity, to make sure that whether it's the richest neighborhood or the poorest neighborhood in New York City, that the services are equal uh, and that we're helping to bridge those, those divides. Last example here, uh, something 
fairly, uh, I think that other cities you've probably seen this before. Uh, we have a very large public transportation system in New York, about 500 and or 5,700 public buses. Every weekday they move around about 2.5 million passengers. And so what we've started to do is we put a, a GPS signal on these buses here. And so the GPS signal is able to provide on our open data portal and through an app, it's able to tell people where the bus is if the bus is on time. Uh, and that's one good thing to have. But then what we also do is we have all of our intersections in New York, our lights are connected wirelessly. And so what that enables when you combine those two technologies, a, a wireless street light with a GPS signal, we're able to actually have the bus signal to the traffic light to change the signal when a bus is approaching, right? So if a bus is approaching, we can, and it's a red light, we can turn to green faster. Uh, and the key here ultimately is to prioritize public transportation, right? Because we know that in buses we have large numbers of individuals uh, that are, you know, we're trying to encourage them uh, to ride share. And if we can help them get from point A to point B, Faster, again, it's a win for the city. Uh, it means less congestion, it means less pollution, but it's also a win for those individual residents whose commute time goes down. And so we've seen just in the deployment of this technology about a 20% reduction in bus transit delays. So there's a few examples there that I wanted to put out there to again sort of emphasize this way in which this technology cannot just be about sort of cool gadgets, but really impacting day-to-day -day lives. And so what's next? Uh, and this, you'll see a lot of similarities with what they were talking about with Bristol. So what we announced a couple months ago is that we're going to be creating a series of neighborhood innovation labs. And the image here, most of you probably don't know this, this is a new neighborhood that we're building in New York. It's called Hudson Yards, and it's on the west side of Manhattan. It was an area that previously had train tracks and we're put it building on top of the train tracks. Basically, uh, an entirely new neighborhood coming up from the, from the bottom up. And when you're doing a greenfield development like this, you're able to instrument it in ways that you could never do a normal community. And so uh, there's all sorts of gadgets and gizmos that are going out in this community to make sure that it is a smart city in many ways like what we're seeing in, in places like South Korea and other uh, Asian communities where they're building from scratch. But we want to make sure again that the cool latest greatest gadgets aren't only deployed in the uh, wealthiest neighborhoods, but we want to make sure that they're deployed in low income communities where they can really have the greatest impact. And so what this sort of network of neighborhood labs is about, and to sort of echo what uh, the previous speakers said, it's about reining in the process of pilots. Uh, right now, the process of doing pilots for many big cities uh, is oftentimes supply driven. And what I mean by that is that you have a lot of big multinational corporations and companies who might be backed by venture capital dollars who really want to, they go into to government, they have a lot of lobbyists and they say, here is you know, my bright shiny object and I want you to deploy this on your street lights or I want you to deploy this in your parks uh, and this is going to make everything great and just let us do it, it's not going to cost you a penny. And it's a really a appealing uh, idea for a lot of city workers. They're like, well, if it doesn't cost anything, sure, I'll put that up. But what happens then is that we have a lot of random pilots as we talked about and they're not actually being conducted as experiments. Uh, they're not actually doing head-to-head -head demonstrations, and most importantly, they're not being driven by need. They're not being driven by the community. And so what we're doing is to turn that up on its head. Uh, we are focusing on a select number of neighborhoods in the city, and they are neighborhoods where we're connecting them with internet access, so they're deploying those links and other uh, Wi-Fi networks, and so leveraging that connectivity to test out new IoT devices, but doing them based upon community needs. And so working with the community residents to define a problem, putting that problem out to the public, and then specifically deploying technologies that respond to that problem, putting them head to head, and seeing which one performs best. And so that's how we can enable that we are actually going to scale in a way that's logical, in a way, again, that's putting communities and government back in the driver's seat. So the last point I just want to make about this, which is important to the 
kind of first speaker's point about privacy and security. And one of the ways that uh, we can ensure standards, whether they be interoperability, privacy, uh, security, really reusing infrastructure, is to to filter those through neighborhood labs. So not have random pilots and random deployments that are happening, but again, having a structure. So if a company comes to a city, they know the process by which uh, they can test their technology and deploy it. So I will end with that, um, and I look forward to talking to you all in the coming days. Thank you.